let's talk about your humble beginnings, the pickle patch. Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, different era of time, different, different uh, era of Steve Aoki for sure. Pickle patch, it, for people that don't know what that is, um, I'm, r- I'm glad you brought that up, was my apartment. It was my living room in my apartment. Is it on the ground floor even? It was on the ground floor. Okay. And it's maybe 300, 400 square feet. Like, it's really small. And we we had, like, we were obsessed punk hardcore kids living there when we were in college. So we ended up doing something like 20 shows a month. Bands started, coming, yeah. Yeah, bands coming through and playing in our living room. And... um and that's where Dim Mock started because I was just around so many incredible young bands. Right. Well, I was just saying name names because I was talking to uh, my buddy Cody from Blood Brothers today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cody's says, my good up? friend. Yeah. Oil, yeah. Um, so I saw like I remember like I saw that flyer for like or in the movie like at the drive-in play. Yeah, at the drive-in play, which was crazy for us. Um, they had no idea it was a living room because they, they like it, it had this like. Lore like the pickle patch. I mean, all these bands are playing at the pickle patch. And I remember when Blaze James hit me up and he's the manager of At the Drive, and he's like, Yo, we are, like the boys want to play at the pickle patch. I'm like, Come on down, you know, like whatever we make at the door is yours, you know. And they're they're like punk rooted band, even though totally. they became like full on rock stars by the um, yeah. So we had them, uh, Jimmy World, a couple times in different variations of what the pickle patch was because I was putting on shows all over. Isla Vista in, in Santa Barbara. Sure. But, um, and then I was in bands. What were your bands? What were they named? What were the names of these bands? Um, so my main band that I was I used to sing in is called This Machine Kills from uh, Woody Guthrie Guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah with this Tom Morello, I think, has it on his yeah, guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and and then I, I was a guitarist in a band called Esperanza. And, I mean, like, I formed a bunch of bands. I, I had a band called Fuck You. <laughs> Catchy. That one's gonna be big. Um, yeah, I mean, we would start bands like like bands would come in. Like my friends would come in from like far from, like that band. Like, the, uh, the guitarist was from from Germany. We, he was in town. I'm like, yo, let's let's just let's create a band. Write some music. We literally wrote five songs. We recorded them. I recorded them in my Tascam four track recorder. I used to record all the shows, and I, I learned how That's, to record. This is on music. cassette tape, by the way. Yes, That's what a Tascam yes, is. If you yes, don't know. yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. And we made the demo, okay? We rehearsed, and we played our first show and last show all in the same day. Wait, this was Fuck You, or this, this was a was different... This Fuck You. I love that. You know, I come from, like, being in bands, but I think what was more spirited that that's transcended the genre for me or, like, transcended the, the you know, the different eras of Steve Aoki was that um, I come from that DIY philosophy that's actually laid groundwork to everything I've done in my business my businesses to, you know, running my label, Dimmock, which is very much an electronic-based label now. Yeah, but people forget that, like, you had, like, you sent, like, what, The Kills and, like, Block Party and stuff? Kills, like that. Block Party, we put out Battles First Record, uh, we put out, like, a, some hardcore bands, we put out um, emo and indie bands, a lot of British bands, Claxons, The Gossip. Claxons. <sighs> yeah, you know, I mean, you're a sub-pop guy, so, like, yep. we both listen to the same thing. I mean, I, I love that label. And, I'm a label junkie, so I follow labels, and that's why I wanted to start a label because I would follow labels and get every single release from certain labels. I grew up in Seattle, so pop whole yeah. thing. My friends and I used to follow what was happening in like 2007, like Dim Mock Tuesdays. Yeah, yeah. And we would like go to you know the CobraSnake.com, yeah, yeah. look at those pictures, like turn on all of the music. Take me back to Dim Mock Tuesdays. What was like the craziest Dim Mock Tuesday? Um, I mean, there's so many different ones, like. Lady Gaga coming through performing that was pretty pretty cool. But at the time, she was just a young artist, right? Well, so, she was on like a Wale song at the time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. She was just like which sampled Justice. I yeah, and that. she yeah. was very hip. She knew what was going on. She wanted to play our party. You know, she was like, I need to play at the Denmark parties, and we would get her to play because we're like, oh, she's a new artist from New York, um, and she's such a she's such a sweet girl. She gets it. She knows culture. You know. Um, one of the most memorable would be when Tomas Bangalter from Daft Punk, and if you're a Daft Punk fan, you'll understand how special this is, but he DJ without his mask on. 
I remember Glenn and got the footage. Yes, yes. Yeah. So you you're you're very you're very educated and aware of what's what was going on. So, I mean the the lineup next to him was was wild. It's like DJ Medi, rest in peace. Somi, uh, Kavinsky. You have uh, Pedro Winter. Shout Bisky, out Pedro. Um, I think too many DJs were there. Possibly. I mean, there's so many. We would do this dim mock Ed Banger annual. I remember and the shirt. It was like it was like a Hydra, and the head was one of them was Cobra Snake, one of them was you, and one of them was Busy P. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. We would always do it together, and Cobra Snake, Mark, would shoot every single party. So he was how you he, he was the lens. I mean, no pun intended. Yeah. To see into the world, like there was no social media besides MySpace, so it was like you want to see what the party looks like. You look through the Cobra Snake blog, mm -hmm. right? And back then why it's so different now to build underground cultures is that you you don't know what's going on unless you're in the room. I was thinking about like the first time I saw you at Coachella, which I think might have been the first time you played. It was like 4 p.m. in the afternoon. Yeah. I think maybe you went on after Bloody Beat Roots. Okay. And like that was the first time I saw like you got in a raft and you crowd surfed in a raft. And yeah. That was the first time I'd ever seen that. Yeah, that, it, was, that was my first shtick, if you want to call it, or my first uh, like... Uh, way to engage with the crowd you know i did the champagne right. stuff but like that one was the cake before the cake you know it was a it moment was, it was definitely a moment i was yeah. like uh what is going this is pandemonium yeah yeah and it's, it's a lot of fun and like and everyone wants to be part of that so once i realized because when i did that so when i when i brought that to the show that was also the first time i really thought about you know looking into a show deeper than just the playlist I'm playing and my mixing, right? right. I, I, you know, before then I would just play bangers and introduce new music and be like a, you know, more of a, a you know, a cultural taste creator, maker. taste maker, whatever, uh, be, be part of like the, you know, this is, I'm represent this culture and boom, like, you know, this is what, this is what the culture sounds like. But, um, but at Coachella, you need, you need to, you need to come bigger than that. You, bring know, you have a stage. So that's when I was like, okay, now I need to prepare. I need to do extra stuff. And I got to do stuff that's unique to Steve Aoki, you know, not just like things that people leave go, oh, I see every DJ going, hey, oh. Sure, you know. standing on the decks, yeah. Right. And like, of course, I'm going to do that anyways. So the hard part is what are those things that will make your show unique? That's the hard part. Um, I'm gonna bring up an awkward thing, which I'm sure people do all the time to you, and they're like, "We at Cross Paths, you don't remember." And we didn't, we didn't talk, but uh, there used to be a festival in Las Vegas called Vegus. Yeah, yeah, I was there. Yeah, and you were there, yeah. and I remember because you were jumping on my shoes, and I was very mad about it. <laughs> we were seeing, we were watching Daft Punk do the yeah. pyramid thing. Oh yeah, yeah, that was epic. So DJ AM, rest in peace, uh, Adam. He he was like begging me to come with him, so I went with him to that, and I was. It was life changing. I mean, a live tour, 07, Coachella, that was, that changed the game for me, really. But like that show was also very instrumental. And as far as making me think differently, inspiring me in a way. And, you know, they, they're gods. They're like literal gods, you know? They're like, I mean, I, I think Pharrell called them aliens. And I was like, it's, they're exactly that. They are aliens from a different planet. And, um, and it's, it's exciting to see something where it moves you so much yet there's not much movement on stage right you know what i mean like you like usually you have to be like like i i come from the, the punk hardcore world so like what moved me on stage was lots of movement lots of like angst and energy and emotions screaming and sometimes Jumping crying around. and like going upside down weird stuff happening on stage right but that punk's the complete opposite it moves you and gets into your soul and it like goes down and the shivers come down your, your spine and your hair is raised on your arms and they're barely even moving. I mean, people forget that like even just like that pyramid, no one had seen anything like that. Like I remember like the Sahara was just like some, like like this kind of shit where it was just like very low key, like yeah. production didn't exist. Like now people take it for granted. Yeah. So it's, massive it's, it's about like focusing on one concept and you know, owning that concept. Which, you know, I think, okay, so that brings me to another question I have, is, like, Neon Future. We're on number four. So do we just not like naming albums other things? You you know, you dipped in, you did Colony, and then you were sort of like, nope, we're back to Neon Future. That yeah. seems like a very specific concept for you. It's just like, it's a it's an ongoing concept that I am obsessed with outside of music. 
It's just, uh, I think it's an overall life goal and pathway. Like, I, I believe that we, you know, I believe in a utopia where there's a convergence of tech and humanity, where we will merge with, with technology in a way that we can do things like live forever, do things that are science fiction based that we would never think would come true. Well, you've done like huge remixes for like, like you did a Soundgarden remix, you did a Black Parade remix. Like what do you, what do you, how do you approach these, these big projects? These are songs that are, that are timeless, these are classics. Yeah, that's like, that's exactly the point. Like the, from those to even more of a classic, like Thriller, you know? Sure. Or, you know, working, working on the Dancing Machine Jackson 5 session and, and hearing Michael Jackson's voice, you know. ISO vocals. The engineer and, and and hearing the drum clicks and like all those kinds of things, like being able to work with the, the you know the hallowed sounds of music culture, um, it's it's a uh, I'll take it I'll take the uh, pressure. I mean, in the beginning I was too afraid, but now I'm like I I need to I need to take the opportunities and do you know obviously my DNA is going to come out whether I like it or not, but right. but make it work for both worlds that's that's like the that's like my goal so now like people think of you at this point as like a like an electronic guy but you've made like a pretty straightforward like rock tune like like almost like i don't know what you call it emo it's like pop punk yeah yeah it's in that vein. talk to me about that like did you and travis sit together are you like on the guitar he's on the drums how did it how did it happen well so that one is i, I worked on that song before travis um i was working out with global global dan and uh, he came up with a lot of it, actually. He's, he's a great writer. He's an incredible writer. I mean, ever since uh, that song, I signed him to Dimmock, and then we um, got in the studio, and I, I'm actually producing his whole project. So, I was going to ask that, too. So, okay, yeah. so, and is it more kind of leaning in that realm? Yeah, it's like kind of in between pop punk and hip hop, just like that song is all about. But there are songs that are hip hop on the project. It's got and big emo are, night LA yeah, energy yeah, to me. On. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we we made uh, a lot of our songs together in my studio, but that song, it started from Dan. And then I'm like, I wanna work on this record. I wanna add um, and and produce this record with you. So then then he sent it to me and then I'm like, we need to get Travis on the song. We gotta, we gotta add that element. I know Travis is gonna love this, you know? And Travis heard, he's like, he loved it, and he, you know, he added his. You guys seem like you have a similar energy. Like, you, like he's everywhere, you're everywhere. You, you guys are always working with all kinds of people. Travis and I have a great bond. We've been working together, and I mean, it's crazy to say over ten years. Like, you know, before 2010. Like, you know, I remember when the Refuse remix, going back to that, came out, and he was like, "Yo, this is a banger. What, what is this? Let's make music like this." And then that turned into Misfits that was on his uh, Let the Drummer Have Some album. I, I produced that song. I recorded guitars on that song. Um, I sampled those guitars. I sang on the song. You know, we, we shot a sick video to that for, you know, in, in like this abandoned house in L.A. Um, but we've had a long, we have a long really musical relationship. You know, like I always go to him when I think about, you know, you know, like a song like this, he's the first person I want to work with. And he's always like coming to me with ideas as well. And you know, obviously, like you said, he works with all kinds of artists from obviously rock, which you know, that's his thing, to hip hop, which he's crushing it with, right. to like the hybrid of those worlds and, and beyond. So, and, and he's a producer and he's like, he's in the ear, he's got it in his ear. He's like, knows what he, what he likes. He's in the studio, he's a studio rat. Um, he's really inspiring, Travis. He really is. You know, I can, I can go on and on about Travis. Man, this this record is really exciting uh, with Global Dan. Yeah, it's great. It's it, I would I would say it's a banger. It, yeah, definitely. And, and just like the same feeling I have when I'm helping, when I find a new artist that, I mean, he's, people know who he is. You know, I'm not trying to say that, but when I find an artist that I want to help blow up, like when I found Block Party and was able to, you know, work with them and and like i was giving out the cds like literally the trunk of my car like you got to hear this band you got to hear the song banquet and or the kills or whatever that same feeling from almost 10 20 years ago i'm feeling it right now so i definitely it's like but now i'm a, I'm a producer more so than just 
signing an act like I, i'm involved in the production and, and that that's even more heartwarming that like we get to build music together so combining both worlds is is like you know that's that's really a great feeling i'm psyched to hear it yeah our first introduction look out global dan 2020 taking over awesome steve thanks yeah. so much for sure thanks man